everybody. The format for these fortnightly vision evenings, so we're going to run now through, I think it's going to be 7 through to the beginning of July. We'll meet every fortnight here in the church. If you're able to come, be wonderful. Very, very simple format. We always start with our eyes on Jesus. We'll start worshipping. We'll take a couple of songs, a few minutes, just to come into his presence and worship him. Then I'm going to share a little bit of the vision that I feel God's given us for this sort of first season together as a new blended church family. And basically going to be working through the bands. That's what we're going to be doing on these Tuesday nights. So we're starting tonight, Love Jesus. That's what we're all about. And in fact, we're going to do another, we'll do the first two sessions on Love Jesus, and then we'll work our way down. Um, and, uh, and then we're, so I'll share a little bit, and then we're going to break into groups, which will be fairly fluid. If you're here tonight, if you're in a regular midweek small group, and you're here with others, then please Make that your, your nucleus of your group. Um, but if you're happy to adopt one or two others who perhaps are here who are not in a regular group, that would be lovely. It would be nice to mix up a bit, get to know each other. Uh, if you've come from the point where you come from St Andrews, it might be nice to join a group, a mixed group, lovely, because that's partly what tonight's all about, getting to know each other. <coughs> We're not kind of committing to those groups. We're not adopting people permanently in any way, or, but it might work out like that, but we're just wanting to spend time together in groups for this evening, um, share a bit, I've got a couple of questions I'd like you to discuss, we can pray together, absolutely no pressure to pray out loud if you're not comfortable praying out loud in a group, but you're welcome to listen to others of course, and pray quietly. So that's the sort of format of these evenings, uh, and they'll each follow a similar, a similar uh, format, just some worship, talk, a bit of talk from me, then into groups. Uh, that's the plan. Okay, let's get started. I don't know about you, but I am encouraged. Uh, I feel the first, uh, first couple of weeks have been, so, have been terrific. I think it's been a great start. I'm so excited uh, to be now one new blended church family uh, everyone's been so welcoming here at St Andrews, which has been lovely. And all the point people who've come from the point have been great coming, throwing themselves in to a new place, a new venue. Uh, we've had some wonderful gatherings together so far, and I've had so many good conversations. So I am really encouraged uh, that we've all pretty much safely arrived and we're up and running. But of course, being honest, it it is also a sort of mixture, isn't it? There's excitement, but we're also feeling a little bit wobbly uh, in all kinds of different ways because it's change. There's so much change for all of us, for everyone, uh, whether we were here or whether we were at the point. Everything's changed. Uh, there's so many new people. There's so many new things. It's a lot to sort of, you know, get your head round. And we've got so many questions uh, who, who is who, you know, who are all these people, who, who, how does it all work, where are the toilets, although actually here at St Andrews, pretty much everywhere you turn there's a toilet, so <laughs> that's good, um, but what exactly are the different roles, and is my role staying the same as it was, or is someone else doing my role now, or is things changing, you know, what's happening with the children and the young people, um, you know, what about the songs, uh, I mean, the songs, that's always the thing, isn't it, that, that uh, people feel the strongest about. You know, I've had various conversations that the songs uh, are too loud, then the songs are too quiet, I can't hear them. The songs are too modern, the songs are too old, uh, the, the, the don't know the songs, or, you know, everybody's got an opinion about the songs, um, and that will continue. Um, and the other question, of course, is where do I park? but we're working on that. You know, these are all important things. These are all really, really important things. But they are details. They're details that all need sorting out and working through. But what's at the center? None of these things are at the center of what we're all about. None of these things are our real focus, our vision, our purpose as we come together. We are 
the church. We are a local church here in Burgess Hill, an expression of God's church. We are the body of Christ here in this place. We're not just a social club. We're not a group of friends who have similar interests. We certainly don't have the same taste in music, that's clear. Uh, you know, we're a mixture of people from all different backgrounds, different experiences, different preferences, different likes and dislikes. We're not some common interest group. We're not a support group where, you know, everybody comes to just feel better about themselves and get the support they need. That might happen, but we are specific. We are unique in that we are people who have encountered Jesus Christ. We are people who gather in response to the call of Jesus on our lives. We have heard his message. We have believed that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We have chosen to follow him. We have been called by him to serve him. We're being formed into the body of Christ here on earth to be used by him to build his kingdom. We are people following Jesus. We all come, it all comes from Jesus, this gathering. To be honest, that's the main thing. We haven't got an awful lot else in common. We might have with some people and not with others, but we all come because of Jesus. It's his initiative. He died for us. He saved us. He rescued us. He gave his life. We love him because he first loved us. So I've written, you know, on the banner, we are people who love Jesus. That's our first thing. That's who we are. We want everyone to know we're a community of people who love Jesus. But actually, it isn't the first thing. The first thing is that he loved us and sent his son to die for us. God loved us and his son to die for us so that we can love him. Our purpose, our vision, it's all about Jesus and it's all about love. We want to be a community of love. That's what I, I shared a bit about that on Sunday morning at the 9 a.m. service. We are a community of love, but only because Jesus first loved us. And these, these four loves that, I've, that we've put up on the banners, first we love Jesus. Then from that we, we love, because of the amazing love of Jesus, we love people, anyone and everyone. Everyone who comes, everyone we come across, whether in church or out in the world where we are, that's our vocation, that's our calling, to love the people that God has made. And then this bunch of people makes up a church and we love church. We don't just come to church. We don't just kind of, you know, sign up for a rotor to make sure all the jobs get done. We love church because it's Jesus' church. He loves church. We're the bride of Christ. Jesus loves church. So we love church. We want it to be the best it can be. We want to give our best to make church amazing. And then we go out for church to love Burgess Hill and beyond. He's put us in this place. We want to see the transformation of our locality, our community, and beyond. We want to use us. Our vision is not just to have a great church and enjoy being together. Our vision is to make an impact on the world where he's put us, to see the transformation of society. That's what Jesus is doing. He's building his kingdom, not just building the church. He's building his kingdom to make an impact on this world. And it sort of goes down the run like that. It doesn't work the other way. You think, well, a lot of people, a lot of people love Burgess Hill. would love to see Burgess Hill be a better place to live and would like to make a difference. There's all sorts of people serving our community, working really hard for Burgess Hill. It doesn't mean they care about church. I mean, they're remotely interested in church. And, and there's actually a lot of people who love church. A lot of people really love church. And church is their thing. And, you know, woe betide anyone who tries to mess with that church or change things or, you know, if people come and they don't fit in because church is, you know, I want it the way I want it and there are people who are very, very attached to church but they're coming at it without coming through Jesus. 
It's their thing and they want to control it and look after it. There's plenty of religious people who are very controlling about church. They love church, but they're coming the wrong direction because they don't love people. They love church because, you know, it's my thing and it's got to be the way I want it. And if people mess around with it, I get very angry. But that's because they love church before they love people. But there are, and there are, people, there are people who love people, who are great with people, wonderful people, people who really care about people, but they don't love Jesus. So it's only Jesus who can change lives. It's only Jesus who can set the oppressed free. It's only Jesus who can bring salvation to everyone who calls out to him. It's got to start with Jesus. Otherwise, what can we do for people? Can we really offer people any hope without Jesus? So, we're gathering as one new church family. We're coming together as one in unity. And the only way we're going to be united is if we start with Jesus. We can't start anywhere else. We've got to start with Jesus. Our focus is on loving Jesus. We start here. We, we can't start with us. If we start with ourselves... You know, what do we like? What don't we like? It's going to be a disaster. It's a recipe for disunity. If it's all about me and my preferences and my likes and dislikes, you know, we can disagree on everything quite easily. But if we start with Jesus, then we'll work everything out. We'll get the priorities in the right order because it's what he wants, not what I want. It's, what, it's his passion, not my passion. It's his vision, it's his mission, it's his kingdom. We start with him. First, he loved us. We can't love him before we truly know that he loves us. John 3.16, a most well-known verse in the Bible probably. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world. That's where it starts. God loved first, so he sent Jesus. And that loved, just to look at the grammar, is in the past tense. God so loved the world. I believe God does love the world. I believe God loves everyone. But the verse says he loved the world. Tonight... I just want to remind us, all I'm going to do tonight is remind us of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And let me tell you, everyone, it's in the past tense. This is the foundation of what we believe. This is, this is our foundation. This is, if you like, our non-negotiable. We can disagree about all sorts of things. We can discuss things. We can have different opinions. But the gospel is our non-negotiable. We have to agree on this because out of this, everything comes. We're all working together because of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to proclaim this wonderful good news to everyone who will listen. Not the good wish of Jesus, you know, that maybe if everything works out, something good will happen. Uh, it's not... Uh, you know, it's not one day, maybe. The gospel is the good news of Jesus. And news is something that's happened. I don't know if you share my frustration sometimes with the news on TV or uh, on the radio, where it's not actually news at all. It's just one opinion after another. Another speculation, another person who's come on to say, yeah, well, I think this, I think that... That's not news. The news is something's happened. The news is the football results. The results. Not someone talking about what they think might happen, but actually what's happened. You know, the news, the ba there's bad news. There's so much bad news, but it's actually something's happened. Something terrible's happened. Some awful conflict, something terrible's happened. Or something good. Wonderful news, someone's had a baby. Or, you know, someone's got married. It's happened. This is news. The gospel is news. It's something that's happened. Telling us what has happened. Jesus has done something for us. 
It's done. It's finished. It cannot be changed. And as the Bible says, it's once for all. A couple of great verses. Romans 6.10. The death he died, Jesus, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. What this means is Jesus died. He took sin on himself, human sin that separates us from God, and he died on the cross once for all. He doesn't have to die again. He, doesn't have to die. he didn't die for some people and not for others. He'd done it once for all. Good news, finished. It's happened. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. We have been made holy. Amazing verse, amazing statement. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all. Once for all, this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross has made us holy if we put our trust in him. God is love, amazing love. You know, he loved the world so much he sent his son. God's amazing love, but God is holy. God is holy. We can't understand the gospel if we don't understand God's holiness. God requires a lot from us. Do you know that? He cannot look on sin because of his holiness. God requires holiness. Holiness. It's, it's a difficult thing to define in just a, a few sentences. God's holiness, his purity, his absolute goodness, his absolute, well, white light is the metaphor of the Bible for holiness. It's so perfect. Perfect love, perfect purity, perfect power, perfection. This is our God. He is holy. And he requires perfect obedience, perfect love, being in complete unity with him. It's what the Bible calls righteousness. Being right with God requires righteousness. It means perfectly right in, with his commandments, his directions, his instructions, his leading. Everything that God wants is righteous. 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 16, Peter writes, for it is written, and he's quoting the Old Testament book of Leviticus, it is written, be holy because I am holy. God requires holiness. You have story after story in the Old Testament with people who are sinful people, impure people, people who all of us are the same. We all fall short of God's standards, coming into his holiness. And what happens? People die when you come into the presence of God's holiness. It's overwhelming. This is why God's saying you've got to be holy, because he wants relationship with us. But if we're not holy, we cannot be in his presence. We cannot exist, cannot survive, because his holiness is overwhelming and all-consuming. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were the most religiously righteous people, most so carefully keeping God's law and following all God's instructions down to the letter, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Jesus. He's saying God is holy. He requires holiness. And Israel, the people of Israel, God's people, they had a whole sacrificial system offering sacrifices daily for sin, to make atonement, to make repair the damage of sin, to get forgiveness so that people could have a relationship with God even though they kept falling short. And the message of the constant sacrifices that were offered in the temple was so clear. The people were hearing sin, breaking God's commandments, being rebellious against God, brings separation from God. In fact, sin brings death the Bible teaches us. Again and again, animals being killed, death, constantly there for the people of Israel, saying sin brings death. Sin has to be atoned for. We cannot approach God as sinful people. And Jesus came, and he lived for us. 
And he died for us on the cross to pay the price for sin once for all. So that all this endless sacrificial system didn't have to continue forever and ever. He took the punishment. He was the sacrifice. He died our death. He removed the barrier between us and God so that we can be forgiven. And forgiveness is available to everyone who turns to Jesus. Most amazing, amazing gift. But so much more than forgiveness. Jesus didn't just take away sin. He didn't just wipe out the negative. You know, it, it, sometimes we think like that. We think, what does God require? He just requires that there isn't any bad stuff in my life. That any sin has to be removed that, and be forgiven. God doesn't just say, you must not make any mistakes. He doesn't say, you must be a forgiven person. It's sort of like going to an exam and handing in your exam paper at the end of the exam saying, I didn't make any mistakes. I didn't make any mistakes. They're totally blank. There's nothing on there, but there's nothing wrong. I didn't put a single wrong answer down. Or I, or I, I did put a couple of wrong ones down, and then Jesus came and you know, rubbed it out. So all, there's no wrong there, so you've got nothing on me. You know, sometimes we can be like that in our relationship with God. Just thinking, as long as I don't do anything wrong, then I'm okay with God. But God wants so much more. What, what do we say? What does God require from us? Perfect holiness, perfect love, perfect obedience, faith. God requires from us this amazing life to the full that he wants us to have as we live in obedience to him. And here, this is the exciting bit that our Father, the Holy One of Israel, requires this righteousness. And Jesus hasn't just come and wiped away the sin. Jesus, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, well, let me read you this. Romans chapter 3, Paul's great thesis, the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans. He spent two and a half chapters at the beginning of Romans telling them, convincing them, arguing, persuading them that a little bit like what I've been trying to do tonight, not nowhere nearly as effectively, that no one is righteous, not even one. He spent two and a half chapters telling it, the, all the, anyway, it doesn't matter, he goes through the different categories and he says, no one comes up to God's standards. Everyone falls short. Not even one is righteous. And uh, it's sort of, oh my goodness, you know, well, what hope is there for anyone? We're all in the same boat. And then Romans chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, he says this, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So you're trying to live a good life. You're trying to do your best. You're trying to follow God. You're trying to keep God's law. But it won't make you righteous. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. He's saying all that the law does and all our best efforts to obey God and our best efforts to live a good life, all they do is show us where we're going wrong. We all know that. You think, well, this is what's required here. This is the standard. And then you think, oh, gosh, I'm trying my best. But all it's telling me is I'm falling short. I'm falling short. I'm falling short. Trying is never going to get us to God's standard. That's what Paul's teaching us in Romans 3. And then he says this. But now, verse 21. So we spent two and a half chapters saying we're all falling short. No one's righteous. What's to become of us? But now. Two of the most amazing words in the whole of the Bible. But now, it's, it's not the end of the story. It's not just depression and doom and gloom and failure. But now, apart from the law, forget about the law. The law can't help us. The righteousness of God has been made known. The righteousness of God, that's what we're after. Not just wiping away the sin and the mistakes, but the righteousness that God requires has been revealed. The righteousness of God, which has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Who is this righteousness? What is this righteousness? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 30 and 31. It's because of him that you're in Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our 
righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it's written, let no one, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's the next verse. It's because of him, Jesus, that you're in Jesus Christ, that you are in him, enjoying his righteousness. He is our wisdom, which is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. It's an amazing verse, an amazing verse that Jesus is our righteousness. So I'm laboring this. What does God require of us? Righteousness, not just forgiveness, removing the debt, the guilt, but righteousness, providing the full credit that he requires of us. What am I saying? It's all done. Here is my favorite definition of the gospel, the definition of God's grace. Everything that God requires from us, he has done for us in Christ. Try and wrap your head around that. Everything that God requires from us, he has done, past tense, finished, he has done for us. And he offers it to us as a gift in Jesus. He says all the holiness, all the righteousness, all the love, the perfect love, all the obedience, all the standards that I require. You can never achieve these standards. We're all trying to justify ourselves, to make ourselves feel better by being good people, trying to compare ourselves with others, thinking yeah, I'm a bit better than them and I'm, I'm doing well and I'm not making so many mistakes anymore, I'm better than I was. All these things are good. But if we're using them to make our relationship, to base our relationship with God on, we are barking up the wrong tree because the righteousness of God has been revealed and given to us as a gift in Jesus. Everything God requires from us, he's done for us. This is the gospel. This is grace. It's done. It's fixed. It's sealed. It's established. It cannot be changed. This is news. This is good news. You know, that's good news. Hey, I've got some good news for you. God's done everything he requires from you. He's done it all, and he's giving it to you as a gift. You just have to receive it. That's good news. You know, hey, God requires a massive list of things that you've got to do in order to be good enough. And you, you've got to, you know, you've got to live a good life. You've got to read your Bible every day. You've got to go to church. You, you've got to be nice to everybody. You've got to give all your money away. You've got to do all these things. You've got to, you know, do a load of pilgrimage and prayer and all these disciplines and stuff. And then if you do all that really, really well, then, you know, Let's hope God will accept you. You know, on that day of judgment, when you finally come before him, he'll look through and think, mm, I don't know, did you do more good things than bad things? That's not the gospel. That's not good news. That's just a great load of worry and anxiety. Think, Am I good enough? Have I tried hard enough? That's got nothing to do with what Jesus has come to do for us. Now, of course, we want to live a good life for God but we're not living a good life in order to get right with God. We're already right with God. This is the opposite of religion. You know, religion's all about what we do. Religion's all those things I just listed. You know, I'm, I'm a very religious person. You know, I do all these good things and I'm, I certainly don't do any bad things. And You know, religion, religion, religion is about me. Well, we're not religious. Jesus. Came, Bonhoeffer famously said, Jesus came to do away with religion. People say to us, don't we? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not religious at all. You know, I, I, I don't go to church. I'm not religious. We should say, neither am I. Brilliant. We've got so much in common. You know, we're not religious. We, we're just, we just enjoy the free gift of God. His righteousness, his gift to us of salvation, of eternal life. It's amazing. The gift of Jesus. It's what he has done. It's not about what we do. You know, the old do versus done. You know, religion is do, 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 do. Grace is put an N-E on the end. Done. Finished. He's done it all. Everything needed has been done by Jesus. We just have to believe it. We just have to believe it. What a brilliant, miraculous answer to the problem. 
It's genius, the gospel. It's so clever. Solving the impossible riddle. How can this perfect, holy, majestic, awesome God have intimate, loving relationship with sinful, rebellious human beings? You've got it. You read the whole Bible from beginning to end. All you'll read is just another failure, another failure, another disaster, another rebellion against God. God gathers his people. He loves them. He blesses them. He teaches them how to live. He gives them the law, gives them the instructions. They say, yes, God. He makes a covenant with them and says, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to bless you. They say, yeah, we're going to be your people. And then five minutes later, they're rebelling worshipping idols, disobeying all his laws. Oh no, and then they repent, they get punished, they come back, try again. Here we go around the same old circle, round, round, the same merry-go-round. Rebelling, failing, coming back, getting forgiven, offering sacrifices, then yeah, we're gonna do it this time, failing, failing. This is the human nature. How can this God, this holy God, who requires righteousness, how can he have relationship with sinful people who cannot live a good life? And then Jesus comes. The gospel comes. He does it for us. All we have to do is believe. It's genius. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them, he's talking about the prophets, not serving themselves but you, when they spoke these things that now have been told to you because they've been preached the gospel, um, to you who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, he's saying, look, it's amazing. You know, even the prophets in the Old Testament had stuff revealed to them. They didn't even know what it was about. Then the people who came and preached to you told you the gospel. They preached these things. It's amazing. Even angels long to look into these things. That's the message of the gospel. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing what God's done for us. Even the angels are gazing at the gospel going, wow, what an amazing, brilliant, beautiful solution to the profound, massive, intractable problem of human nature and the holiness of God. It's all done, all by Jesus. It's all God and all his grace. We contribute nothing to our salvation. It's humiliating. You think, oh, I'm sure I could just give a bit, you know, if I tried really hard to be good, nothing. We give nothing. And this is the great leveler. This is how we're going to be united as a church family when we all get hold of the gospel. No one deserves it. No one can earn it. We're all in the same boat. We're all saved by grace. Some of us might be living a better life. Some of us might be more talented than others, more gifted. Some of us might have all sorts of problems and disasters. Some of us might keep making mistakes. We're all the same before God. We're all saved by grace. We all contribute nothing to our salvation. We are only saved by the righteousness of God, the free gift of the righteousness of God by believing in Jesus and what he's done for us. We're free. We've got nothing to prove, nothing to earn, nothing to pay, no one to compete with. It's all done. So does it even matter how we live? Quoting the Bible, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, after Paul's explained the gospel, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we just go on sinning so that grace may abound? Shall we just carry on with the sinful life? Because it doesn't matter how you live, because God's done it all. It's got nothing to do with us. Paul says, by no means, of course not. We want to live to please God. But I heard Terry Virgo once, great, great preacher, New Frontiers preacher, say, of course we don't continue sinning. But if you've never asked the question, have you ever really understood grace? Because theoretically, of course, you, it doesn't matter how you live because it's all God's grace, it's all God's righteousness. But when you get that righteousness, when you realize what he's done for you, you have to love Jesus. You have to love Jesus. I mean, if you carried on sinning, rebelling against God, you... Could you possibly have grasped his love for you and what he's done for you and the genius of the gospel and the amazing gift of eternal life? Of course not. When you understand God's grace, you want to live to please him. Of course you do. You want to live to bless him in all things. So, this is how we're going to be united. This is how we're going to live 
to please him. I'm going to come into land. I'm going to finish there. Talk for too long. But I get excited about the gospel. What an amazing, amazing gospel we have. This is what we're uniting around. We are a community who love Jesus because he first loved us and gave himself for us. This is the wonderful good news of the gospel that we want to share with everyone. Jesus is amazing. He has done something so wonderful for each one of us. He is our righteousness. He has made us right with God forever. So we love him. This is what we're going to do together. We are going to love Jesus and we're going to seek to help each other love Jesus better. Here here at St. Andrews, first and foremost, may we be known as a people who love Jesus. Amen. Uh, We're going to spend, well, we've got about 25 minutes because I want to finish at quarter two. We're going to get into groups and we're going to consider two questions. So you can form a group, as I say, form a group. If you're here with some people in your regular group, form a group with them, perhaps... If you're here, you're not normally in a small group, please join one of the other groups. Just join in and mix up if you can with those you don't know. That would be wonderful. Um, Two questions to discuss in our groups. Number one, oh, I don't know if we've got these. Yes, we have, James. We can leave those up. When did you first truly realize that Jesus is your righteousness? It's just a different way of asking when did you become a Christian, but it's a little bit different. You know, when did you really grasp that Jesus is your righteousness before God? You don't have to impress God. He's already given you everything he requires from you. Now you've got to live it out. So when did you first realize that Jesus is your righteousness? And secondly, what are you thankful for about the blend, about coming together? It'd be nice just to share a few encouragements. Obviously, introduce yourselves and nice to just make contact and make sure we get to know each other a little bit. Um, so, uh, just before we go into groups, next week, so we're not, we're meeting fortnightly here, so if you're in a small group, next week you'll be back in your small groups in homes, uh, and I've got some notes, some questions for groups to study next week, and I'll put them by the door there, so leaders, please take one of these sheets, which is questions for next week's study. If you're not in a small group and you would like to be, please come here next Tuesday. And I'll put say this on Sunday. Anyone who'd like to be part of a small group, if, if you're invited to one tonight, great. But otherwise, come here and we'll form a new small group. We'll see how many we get. We'll have a group here next Tuesday, especially for the people who've been on Alpha. The post-Alpha people will be here next Tuesday if you'd like to come and join us. Um.